nanohub.org. You can follow along with this presentation using printed slides from the NanoHub. Visit www.nanohub.org and download the PDF file containing the slides for this presentation. Print them out and turn each page when you hear the following sound. Enjoy the show. So now let's look at the incoherent scattering treatment in Nemo 1D. Again, here is the prototypical motivation of the device, why we want to understand the valley current. And here's where we left off at the previous presentation that, all right, we, we're close to experiment in terms of the peak current here and getting the details of the turn on right, but we're not doing well on the, on the valley current. So the, the, the general assumption is, was still in 1994, 96, uh, that must be scattering. So let's look at what scattering there could be. I'm going to walk you through a couple of examples of uh, sources of scattering. So what we have is a, a man-made resonator, a double barrier structure. And we understand that there's a resonance in there and that you can have transmission through these resonances. If you've done anything in optics, you know there's these fabric paroles, double, uh, double mirrors, two, two mirrors, and you have standing waves in there. If you've done any work in there, you, can, you know that you get a transmission peak for every resonance frequency in there. There's also experiments where you might wiggle the mirror with a certain frequency. And what you do is, you know you're going to create sidebands on these transmissions. If you don't do it in optics, you might have done this in electronics, where you have a bandpass filter and you start wiggling the bandpass filter, you're going to put sidebands on your bandpass filter. Well, what you have in semiconductor devices, especially in polar semiconductors like gallium arsenide, you have a crystal lattice underneath that likes to rattle at certain frequencies. And that can be a coupled oscillator problem. If there's discrete frequencies of these uh, uh, vibrational modes in the crystal, they can impose sidebands. So indeed, what you can have, here's an IV now on, on a log-log scale, that if you include polar optical phonons that in gallium arsenide are at 36 millielectron volt, you can basically create an echo in the IV curve where you can come in at a high energy, emit a phonon, fall down, and come, come out at the resonance. So that indeed is a physical mechanism that we can model within NEMO, and that uh, is present in the real devices. I'll show example, uh, examples of that. Another important scattering mechanism in these devices is that these interfaces that we think of being perfectly flat are in fact not perfectly flat. So here's an SEM image of an indium phosphide, indium gallium arsenide RTD. And you can see that you have interfaces that are reasonably flat, and then an interface that is rough, and then again an interface that is flat, and an interface that is rough. Okay? It's not even symmetric in a device. It's not like every interface is rough. It seems like every other interface is rough. And that depends on the physics of the growth and the material details. That means if your electrons flow one way or the other, they see different symmetries of the device. And there's ways to include that, and we'll talk about how to include that in a later seminar. But this, the equivalent to that in an optical sense is you have crud on the mirrors. The crud on the mirrors gives you diffractions that modify the eigenfrequencies of your spectrum. And depending on where you are uh, on this mirror, you kind of see slightly different resonances. And that's kind of what interface roughness does. It starts to move your resonance peaks around, so to speak. That's the intuitive picture you can have. And in the forward and reverse bias direction, you might have different IV curves. So in one direction where you see a lot of interface roughness, you see a lot of scattering in the valley current. In the other bias direction where the material looks kind of flat, you see only very little interface roughness scattering. 
And again, I'll make this quantitative against experiments in a little while. Why is there this asymmetry? You can look at, uh, here's a pictorial diagram of a double barrier structure where I indicated on the left uh, the plot the interface roughness being on the right edges of these barriers. And if you plot in a wave function like this, with under bias, you have some intuition that the wave function will penetrate deeper or experience more of the right barrier than on the left barrier. Because there's an electric field and it's being pushed more into that barrier and a little bit away from the emitter barrier. In the other bias direction, so I'm just going to turn the device around, the interface roughness is on the rising edges of these barriers. And the central RTD will be pushed into these rough device edges. So it will experience more scattering in this bias direction. That is the intuitive answer why a forward and reverse bias, the interface roughness scattering will be different. Then there's a third mechanism, which is kind of like alloy, well, it's alloy disorder scattering. And you could argue that in the optical equivalent, that is sort of impurities in your mirrors or in your active gain medium, that it's not all homogeneous. And why is that in an alloy, a true alloy is disordered. It's not completely homogeneous. There's no perfect ordering in an alloy. And later, uh, we will have lectures on alloy disorder scattering or alloy disorder from a fundamental point of view uh, of representing the alloy disorder explicitly. In Nemo 1D, we took a statistical approach and developed scattering self-energies that describe the alloy disorder. Turns out in RTDs, this alloy disorder is not all that critical. So you, it raises the valley current up. It's similar to the um, acoustic phonon scattering, which in general is also not very strong.